Hello and welcome to this video about the floor function and its associated theorems. We'll start by defining the floor function. It is a function applied to a real number and that returns the next lowest integer by setting everything after the decimal point equal to zero. The floor function of any integer is equal to the integer itself. Here you can see some examples of the floor function. So here's the first theorem, which says that if you add a real number to an integer, then the floor of this new number is equal to the floor of the real number added to the integer. It seems obvious enough, but it can be proven using some manipulation so that it might be more rigorously seen to be true. So the first thing to do is to split the real number up into its integer and non-integer components and call them A and Epsilon. The Epsilon component may be the name given to this amount that is less than 1. We can then rewrite this first expression using these new components so as to follow them inside the floor function. You can already see here that epsilon will be discarded, leaving only a and b. And we can take b outside the function, since it is an integer, and won't disturb the value of epsilon. And we can substitute x back in for a and epsilon, and lo and behold, the theorem has been proven. And now to prove this very obvious looking theorem. It is obviously true because the numbers inside the floor function are exactly the same, but we can do better than this. In the first line of this proof, we use this property of exactness to show that they are equal outside the floor function, and therefore they must be equal when inside it, because their integer components are equal. And now to prove that this is true you should be able to see that it is just a special case of Theorem 1.1, where a real number is added to an integer. But we can write it out a bit more formally. We'll get ready to substitute it into Theorem 1.1 by setting x equal to the real part, and setting b equal to the integer part. And after substituting it in, we can see that this theorem is also true. And now to prove this not-so-obvious theorem involving division and applying the floor function twice. We start off by setting the real part called x to be this expression. It has some interesting properties that make it useful for proving this theorem. So firstly we substitute this expression in for x. So then we set it equal to this. The part of the expression added onto a is always less than 1. You might be able to see this already. So since b is less than c, then it is less than or equal to c minus 1. This is because they are both integers, and can't be anything in between. Since epsilon is less than 1, when it is added to b, the total is less than c. Since b is at most c minus 1, adding epsilon to it will mean that it will always be less than c. So dividing both sides of this equation by c gives us this, which gives us this expression, this is always less than 1. So we can put brackets around this expression, highlighting that it is less than 1, and so this function returns a as the answer. And we can add this to a inside the floor function, since it is less than 1 and added to an integer. And we can rewrite this expression like this, which is a sort of unsimplification. And we can write the second floor function in, because it is an integer. And we can add the epsilon onto the end, since it is less than 1 and added to an integer. And we can substitute x back in for this expression, thereby completing the proof. I have rigorously tested this theorem using a computer program as well. 
And now to prove this theorem. You can easily see that it's just a special case of the last theorem. So to prove it, we must only substitute the numbers back in for the last theorem. And now to prove this last theorem, which looks more messy and not obvious. We can use this first theorem to make the first step, bringing it inside the floor function. And then this second step is just a repeat of the last theorem that we've proven. This is an important theorem because I'll use it to find the continued fraction for the square root of any integer. I decided to keep these proofs in a separate video because they could be viewed on their own and people might like to look at them without reference to continued fractions. So I hope that you have enjoyed this video and learnt from it and I wish you all the best in your quest to study this sort of mathematics.